Okay, everyone, let's come on back, find a seat, maybe find a new seat if you found one better. You just never know. So come on in. Thank you for participating in our little fun ridiculousness. You know, we all look good on Easter. We all need an excuse to take pictures to show everyone how cute we look on Easter. When we work this hard to look good, we need a couple of pictures. I would also like to say out in the lobby, we have our selfie station. Well, actually, it's not even a selfie station. It's just for your family, for you. Angie will be outside there in her Kelly green dress, and she will take all the pictures for you. So make sure you get a picture. Oh, okay, let's pray. What an honor to get to open the Word of God with you guys together today. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you fall in this place? Lord, 2,000 years ago, you did something that changed the course of history. And Lord, we are the ones, 2,000 years later, that you prophesied. You said, blessed are those who believe even if they do not see. Blessed are those who believe even if they don't get to put their fingers in my side and in the nails in my hands, blessed. Lord, we get to sit here today as those that Jesus called blessed. So God, I pray as with this heart posture today that we open your scriptures, that we talk about your resurrection and why it matters. Lord, would you fall in this place? Lord, for people who have heard this message 60, 70 times, would there be something new and fresh for them today? Would no one leave this room unchanged? In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Okay, guys, we are all born with eternity in our hearts, all of us. And this eternity DNA is not something that we conjured up on our own, but I believe it was placed by God himself inside of every human being that is born on the planet. I believe that that's why Scripture describes human beings as made in the image of God because we have eternity in our hearts. 700 years before Jesus came to earth, Solomon wrote a very profound statement that articulates this. In Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, he says, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. It's why every religion in the world offers a hope of life after death. Now that hope takes various forms like reincarnation or a happy hunting ground in the sky or the proverbial heaven or hell. But the understanding of a life after death has never been disputed in any religion around the world. The secular worldview is the first in history to communicate a different narrative, preaching that human life is devoid of eternal value and meaning, that this is it, that when we die, we die forever. Immortality in the secular worldview, the way to live forever is to get yourself into a history book, whether by good deeds done, great things achieved, or infamy. That's why when you read a news story about someone that does an atrocious act, maybe they, they kill a bunch of people and before they kill themselves, they do something really awful. So many of them say, I want to be remembered after my death. And they know that they can't do it by being the smartest. They know that they're living an average life at best. So they're like, how can my life have meaning? And if I can't do it in a positive way that I'm gonna be remembered after death, I might as well go the other way. I might as well be the infamous one. 
And we've spent our Lenten series confronting lies that we believe about ourselves, that we believe about others, and that we believe about God that prevent us from fully participating in the metamorphosis, the transformation that God invites every single one of us into. And He does. And today we're looking at the final lie. The modern lie, and it is a modern lie. If there ever was one, it's this one, that there is no life after death. And as secularism replaces religion in so many of the spaces that we call home, and there are many, so many of the spaces we inhabit, we see this fear on full display, this life, there is no life after death fear. This fear manifests itself in the YOLO declarations, right? You only live once, take life by the horns. This bravado, right, that masks a fear of death. It shows itself in the extreme efforts by so many to preserve life by any means necessary. It's revealed in the depression and the anxiety that chokes us when we feel like we've somehow missed the plan and the purpose or the chance to have a life of meaning. It's that niggling thought that haunts you in the wee hours of the morning or the the darkness, right? Right before you go to sleep that stokes your doubt. It's that super smart friend at work that smirks when you mention church. (laughs) It's the bless your heart look you get when you're like, yeah, Easter. And they're like, (laughs) you Do you legitimately believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Like still, you know, that look, anyone had that look? The, I almost feel sorry for you because you're kind of a dummy look. Oh, but let me tell you this morning, this no life after death lie exists only in the mind, not the heart. It's why 11% of atheists interviewed by the latest Pew Research say that they pray weekly, even though they don't know why. Even more atheists say when they find themselves in trouble, when they find themselves in desperate times, a sick child, a car accident, an issue where they realize their life could go upside down. Maybe they committed a crime and they don't wanna be caught. They find themselves praying. Who? They don't know. Because no matter what our mind thinks, eternity lives in our hearts. It lives there. It's inside of you. And the resurrection of Jesus is the single most definitive event in the history of our world. Why? because it tangibly demonstrated the eternity that we know and feel in our hearts, that Solomon spoke about, gave voice to, and it put it on full display in a touchable, physical way, in a way that our minds could comprehend. You see, Jesus' resurrection took this life after death heart knowledge and connected the dots. I like the old Netflix series, you know. I love a good binge watch. It's probably one of my favorite things in the last 15 years that's happened in the world is the fact that I don't have to wait for the next week for a, uh, the next part and then reorient my whole life around said show. Um, you know, when Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman first came out, <laughs> I'm telling you, I gave up a lot of things. I was invested in that relationship with Sully. (sighs) I remember I actually got asked out on a date and I'm like, it's Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman night and I kid you not. I was not giving that up for nobody and no one because in those days, it was lost to the universe forever. If you didn't watch it at the appropriate time, you may have never seen it ever again. It just disappeared. Maybe in 30 years, you'd be an old lady and be like, finally, 
I get to watch the episode I missed. Oh, but lately, what I've realized is my favorite TV shows, the ones, the series that I like, I call them the slow burn. They're when something's going on and there's only one person that knows the truth, right? And they're like normally a grizzled detective, you know, seen too much, <laughs> you know, burned out, washed up, weird. And he's like, I just know in my gut, or she says, I know that this guy is bad and no one believes them, you know? The other cops are like, oh no, they're fine. The other people around them are like, no, they give to charity, they're amazing. And they're like, mm, mm, mm. And they're showing up to the events and they're watching them do the talk and give a million dollars. And they're like, no, you're a pedophile, you loser. I like those shows. And then my favorite part is when the grand reveal comes, right? When the grizzled detective that's held it in their hearts this whole time and doggedly pursued it. Finally, it's revealed to the whole world. And then my favorite part isn't just like, oh, the person is arrested and everyone knows. I like the episode afterwards where then they go through everything, right? Every part of everything. And they're like, and then that's when they did this. And that's when they did that. And you're like, yeah, she was right. Get it. Woo. I love it. I love the great reveal. And I realized that great reveal is also something that God has placed in my heart. That great reveal is something that Jesus put in there and he put on full display for all of us to see. You see, the resurrection was the great reveal of all time. He showed once and for all what his plan for humanity was after the fall. Bang, here it is, mic drop. So what we're gonna do today because it is Easter Sunday, is we're gonna open our Bibles to Luke 24 and we're gonna read it. We're just gonna read the whole story because that matters. We're gonna read Luke's account of the resurrection. And then we're gonna talk about some of these revelation moments that took the truth that we know in our hearts, placed it in our minds and gave us the ability to communicate it. Okay, you ready? You ready to read this? Luke 24. We're gonna start right at the very beginning of Luke 24. Read along with me. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was with you in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners to be crucified and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered his words. <gasps> Great reveal. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and all of the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, oh gosh, I love Peter so much. All the other disciples are like, this is bonkers. And Peter's like, but is it? <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> I am so curious. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed with these things about each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their face downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. 
about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one that was gonna redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. And in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to see the tomb and they found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to where they were going, Jesus continued as if he was gonna go further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us. It's nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, was not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and they said, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told them what happened on the way, how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. And while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them. And they said, and he said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost. But he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And we had, when he had said this, he showed him his hands and his feet. And while they did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he said, do you have anything here to eat? And he, they gave him a piece of boiled fish. That's sad, okay? I'm like, if I died and resurrected, give me cake. Give me the best cake. Give me the best dessert that has ever been created in the history of the world. I want it all. But he got a piece of broiled fish. What a tragedy. Okay, back to the fish. And took it and ate it in their presence. And he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Oh, and this is the part that's the best part, guys. Pay attention to this. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the Scriptures he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Woo, we did it guys. I wanted to read that whole thing because I wanted you to understand what was going on. You see, Solomon, if we go back to Solomon at the start of this sermon, he penned the text that we started with today. He named the lived experience of a human before Jesus rose from the dead. You see, Solomon was saying, I know deep in my heart that there is life after death but I don't understand how this heart knowing fits into what I see with my eyes. There is an eternity in my heart that my mind can't fathom because no matter how much eternity lives in my heart, death is what I experience. People I love die, dreams die, marriages die, my pets die. Everything seems to die. And I believe that this is why Jesus in Matthew chapter 13, verse 16 and 17 said to his disciples, 
But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but they did not see and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. I believe that Jesus was telling them, guys, you are so privileged because everything that has led up until this now, they have gotten glimpses and pictures and feelings and all of these things in your heart. You get the full story. And He's shaking them awake, telling them this. Let's think about it. The women at the tomb. The women at the tomb show up how I love these women so. They see something. If you notice, they're the ones that show up when everyone else is just depressed and sitting by themselves in a, in a room. The women are like, there is work to be done and there is Jesus who we love. And they did not give up on Him even in death. I was listening to my favourite devotional app this week, Lectio 365. Oh, love it. And Pete was doing it this week and he said this really amazing statement. He said, Everyone wants Jesus alive. Everyone while Jesus was alive was trying to get something from Him. Jesus, heal me. Jesus, tell me something wise. Jesus, explain the Scriptures to me. Do all of these things. He said, but there was a few people that when Jesus was dead and could give them nothing, still chose to be with Him. And I think that's so beautiful. Are you prepared to sit with Jesus even when He doesn't give you what you want? Is He enough? For the women at the tomb, He was. He was worthy of their praise. He was worthy of their presence even when He was not giving them what they wanted, even when He was dead. I love these women. And when they went back to tell the guys, the guys were like, no, 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 at Peter, something in Peter's heart. Eternity was living in Peter's heart. And he was like, oh man, if there's even a chance that Jesus is alive, I'm getting myself there. Let's think about the road to Emmaus. Jesus talking to these young men walking. When he says, beginning with the scriptures, Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And the famous line that they say to one another, were not our hearts burning within us when He talked with us on the road and opened the Scriptures to us. As Jesus talked to them, He engaged the eternity DNA that was in their hearts first. Their hearts were so open, it started to burn, literally burn with fire because they're like, could this be true? In Jerusalem, and it says, Jesus says, and this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. I say all of this to say today, my friends, Easter Sunday matters so much because Jesus connected the eternity that lives in all of our hearts with the mind that struggles to make sense of the death that we see all around us. When Jesus opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, He was showing them the story of God and how the story of humanity and the story of God wove together that the eternity DNA came from our original design before sin came into the world and death came into the world. That eternity DNA that lives in us was because we were always meant to live forever. We were always meant to be in communion with Jesus always and forever. It's why when Jesus was standing outside of the tomb of Lazarus, He said to Martha, His sister, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. Like she knew it in her heart, right? That death isn't the end. And Jesus is like, hello, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. It's me. You don't have to wait until the end. You're staring at the resurrection right now. I am the resurrection. He who lives by believing in me will never die. And he asks her, do you believe this, Martha? Oh, you see this eternity of the heart 
that we all carry was not just a future promise anymore. It was not a cross your fingers and hope for some type of heaven, type of hope. Jesus was standing right in front of Martha and he's like, it's me. Believe in me. And because I am the resurrection, resurrection power starts right now. And a week later, when Jesus rose from the dead, He showed on the outside with His physical body what every human knew to be true deep in their hearts, right? We were not created to eke out an existence on this earth only to die and it to be the end. We were created to be eternal. We were created to live in resurrection power. And that is good news, my friends. You see, the resurrection of Jesus was the first fruits. It was this tangible promise of a future physical resurrection in which all of the material world will be renewed. A world where justice dwells, every tear will be wiped away, death and destruction will be banished forever, ever, and the lion will lay down with the lamb. Guys, I don't know, sometimes we forget this as Christians, but if you call yourself a Christian, you believe that one day you will rise on this earth again. Do you know that? Do you know you're not just gonna be living in heaven? I feel like I have to keep reminding people because we don't really talk about this a lot as much. The promise of resurrection is that we will be raised to life back into our bodies again, here. Not just in heaven, here on earth. And that gives me so much hope because there are people I have loved and lost that I can't wait to hug with real bodies again. There are babies that died before their time that I can't wait to see grow up. There are people that I cannot wait to sit and love and talk and laugh with and eat food with that isn't broiled fish. I cannot wait. Let me tell you, my resurrection feast that I will be cooking after I am resurrected will be different than what poor Jesus. I'll be like inviting Jesus to my house. I'll be like, you will get a better feast at the house of the Camp Forsyth than you will with your dumb old disciples, okay? But here we are. And that happens one day. But I'm not here just to talk about one day and one day is wonderful. The resurrection of Jesus tells us that we don't have to wait until we die to experience this new life. You see, Jesus could have used his death to exit from his body the way we all do and exit from planet earth and go to paradise and be with the Father. He could have done that. And no one would have faulted him because that's what we all do as humans, right? We're alive here on earth. Then we leave and the promise is you will be with me in paradise. I have prepared a place for you. That's fantastic. Jesus did that too. But Jesus chose to return in a glorified physical body. He wanted every single one of us to know we get to participate in this resurrection. And the promise of this future resurrection means that nobody misses out on experiencing the world the way it should be, the way it was originally intended to be. Just because Solomon lived 700 years before Jesus came to earth, just because Solomon didn't get to experience the full revelation of what God was up to while he was on earth, doesn't mean that he has to miss out. You know, when you rise, Solomon will rise too. This is the hope of resurrection. This is the holy resistance that Christians carry deep within their souls that counteracts the lie of nothingness. My friends, you were created to be eternal. Eternity lives in your hearts. And Jesus has made it possible and made a way for you to understand it with your mind so that you can explain it to others. And all he asks for is that you would trust him with your life. Trust that Jesus will bring beauty from a world that feels so broken. If you pay attention, there was no reference of a gospel message, of a good news message 
until Jesus connected the eternity in the hearts of the people with the mind to understand it. We didn't have the ability. We could worship God, we could praise God, we could serve God, but we didn't know how to communicate His message until Jesus came. Why? Because Jesus had to do physically and show us what only He could do. Resurrection life is possible and it begins now. I wanna share a personal story to close. A few days after my first husband, Simon, died, I traveled to Spain to retrieve his body. And there is something about coming face to face with the body of a person you loved that is no longer there, that is so sobering. When you grieve and you sit and you look at a person that you love, you're instantly in a turmoil of soul where you, re- you feel like everything is gone. You don't know what the future looks like. You can't see a road ahead. Everything that you look at feels dark and bleak and broken and gray. And when you grieve the death of a person or a marriage or the death of your reputation, let's be honest, many of us have experienced that when you grieve the death of incarceration, when you grieve the seeming death of addiction, you feel like there could be no hope for a future. And you grieve not only the life that you shared, that you actually had, but you grieve the life that you wanted to have. You grieve the life that hadn't happened yet, but had the possibility of happening that you had hoped and dreamed for. And when you sit in the ashes of that, it is quite terrifying. After returning from that experience, which was so surreal, I found myself unable to think clearly walking in a fog. It was that day, I was still in Madrid, that an artist, a liturgical artist that I followed on Instagram called Scott the Painter posted a design that he had created and it floored me. You'll see it up here. I saw this within three or four hours after visiting the body of my husband. And I felt like the stump, chopped off, the big beautiful tree wiped out. All I saw was destruction, all I saw was loss and I didn't see any life for me beyond the death that I was facing. But God used this little illustration that now hangs in my office. Nick Bradley, bought it for me and framed it and hung it up because he was with me in Madrid and he knew how important that image was to me when I saw it. God used this little illustration to remind me that he brings life from death. And the tender new little branch growing up from the severed stump of the former tree quickened the eternity DNA in my heart. My brain wasn't working. My mind couldn't fathom anything. It couldn't comprehend. But here, in here, in my heart, the eternity DNA kicked into gear. I looked at that picture and I said, could it be possible? Can it be possible? Could God bring any new life out of this absolute destruction? Brain said no. Eternity DNA said yes. Resurrection life doesn't have to wait till you leave this earth, my friends. Jesus ushered in a whole new way of being human. And he showed us that we can live in the power of the resurrection right now. I want you to close your eyes as we respond to the word of the Lord today. Here in this church, we respond We respond physically with our body. We respond in our hearts. We lean in. However comfortable you feel, I'm gonna ask you to find the most comfortable way in which you engage with the Lord. 
you can close your eyes, lift out your hands, you can get on your knees before the Lord, you can stand, you can do whatever you need to do. But what I'm asking you to do is position yourself to hear from God because He's speaking. To the first group of people here as you're responding to these words, I wanna tell you today that eternity lives in your heart, but your mind feels tortured. You're in this room today because of the eternity that lives in your heart. There's something in you that just keeps saying, but what if, you're like Peter, right? You're sitting in a room with all of these other people saying, Christianity, it doesn't make sense. And this doesn't match with this. And this doesn't match with that. And, and what about this? And this incongruency. And everyone is feeling very smart and sophisticated and very sure of their intellect and their intelligence and that they have worked out the mysteries of the universe. And then someone says, Hey, but what about Jesus? And something flutters in your heart. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you find yourself running to the tomb anyway. Just to look, just to see. Maybe that's how you came to church today. It's Easter Sunday. Everyone else in your family thinks this is weird. Your friend group would roll their eyes if they knew you were here, but somehow you're here. And I want you to know that that is the eternity that God has placed in your heart. Your mind might be covered with, with a whole heap of manure that is closing your mind to be able to understand, but your heart knows. Your heart knows that you were created to be eternal. Your heart knows that there's something about this Jesus guy. Your heart knows that if it's true, if Jesus is true and He really rose from the dead, then it changes everything. It changes everything about your life. It changes everything. And you're just curious enough to try. And if you're here today and that is you, you're like, I, ah, my mind feels completely polluted, but my heart, there is something that flutters alive when someone talks about Jesus and eternal life. And I know it's real. If you were here in this place today and you just wanna say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, I need you. I need you to help me connect the dots between my heart and my mind. If that is you today, with no shame and every eye closed, I just want you to put your hand up and say, that's me. That's me, Mel, I need prayer. Yeah, thank you. Don't be afraid. Thank you for that hand. We have time to wait. Is there anyone else you just wanna lift your hand and say, I want Jesus. Yeah, I see that hand, I see that hand. Thank you. He sees that hand. He's, that is all He needs. You think of the thief on the cross, did nothing except remember me, Jesus. Jesus is like, that's enough. <laughs> Come with me, let's go to paradise. We're gonna pray a prayer right now. And if you raised your hand, we are praying with you. I need you to know that. So let's pray together as a family. Jesus, I, I say yes to you. My mind is confused, but my heart is clear. So I choose you, fill my heart with your resurrection power. I repent of the times I've walked away, I've chosen myself and I've sinned against you. I ask for your forgiveness. And I ask that you would clear my mind so that I might understand what I know to be true in my heart so that I can share your good news with a world that needs it. Amen, amen. There's others of you in here and as I talked about, different stages of your life, you could be in a place, and I know you are because I was, 
where you're facing a death in your life of a dream, of a marriage, of hope. You just don't feel like you've got any left. You can't see a way forward. Maybe addiction has its hold on you and you cannot see a life without that substance. Everything feels dark and grey. And in the name of Jesus right now, what we're gonna do as a family is I'm gonna ask if you are in that place right now, you do not need to stand up, you do not need to make yourself known, but I just want you to hold your hands out and say, Lord, I am giving you my life all over again. I want you just to do it on your own. I want you to do this with the Lord and just say, God, I I am choosing to believe with my heart that my life can be resurrected right now. And may you feel the Holy Spirit fill you as you respond to His Word. As you respond. There's an invitation for you right now while there is breath in your body that it is not the end for you. The Lord will fulfill His purpose for your life. No matter what death you're facing right now, we serve a God of resurrection power. Trust Him with it. Okay, my friends, we're gonna stand to our feet. Um, We do communion in our church every Sunday and I just wanna demonstrate for you if you're new here how we do communion so that you're prepared. Thank you, AJ. We have three communion stations in our church. We have one at the back. And we have two either side here of the front. And we love to be able to participate physically in this act of communion, communally. The fact that communion, most of that word is commune um, with God, but also with one another. We encourage you to take communion as a family together to come forward and to receive the body broken and the blood shed for you receive the forgiveness of God this morning. The way we do it is we take this cracker and we dip it in the juice and we thank the Lord for His body and His sacrifice. We don't pick the cup up and drink it um, because that would be awkward for everyone else. So we keep it just like this. And if you um, are gluten-free or immunocompromised, we have little, um, some hopefully things for you. If not, the Lord will love you and work miracles in your life. Even if you can't take it physically today because I can't see that magic communion. So we're back to the matzah, guys. Okay, so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, He took the bread, He broke it, He gave it to His disciples and He said, this is my body broken. For you do this in remembrance and with me. And in the same way, He took the cup And He said, this is the cup of my new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's take communion as the redeemed of the Lord this morning. Thank you.
Okay. We are going to do a final song to send you on out. I'm going to get you to stand on up. I know. Jen and Charlie just sat down. I was like, no, don't do it. Don't do it, guys. Stand back up. Okay. And this is the, give you a clue, this is the first song we sang, which is peppy and upbeat. Okay. And I just want you to know I come from a family when I was growing up in Australia and we danced at church all the time. And I mean, even my brother Nick danced. So we danced, okay? Okay, I'm saying. So what I want you to do, what I want you to do, uh, Steve, can you just give me the beat? Just give me the beat, the BPM. Okay, so we're gonna practice moving. This is a signature uh, Gleason dance here in Australia. We did the little kick out. Oh yeah, Nick, we just moved. My father did this every Sunday of his life. He still does it. So we're gonna get here. So however you worship the Lord, I'm gonna encourage you. We call this the Pentecostal two-step in Australia. Um, but anyone else, I want you to move, okay? This is our last song, Jesus is Risen. Our old life is dead. We get to come alive in Jesus and we're gonna move. So, okay, let's go band, I'm gonna dance.